Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a a Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hardworking Macedonian welcome to the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast. This is another exciting episode, episode 13. We are recording on Thursday, February 7, 2019. My name is Jason Miko coming to you from Oro Valley, Arizona and the foot of the Catalina Mountains. And this is Tvitan Shulimanov calling in from uh, Skopje. I'm closer to the Varda River than to any mountain and the closest mo- mountain I get here is uh, uh, Mount Vodno, the overly used uh, trimming track for uh, all the Skopjaners around here. <laughs> I still like Vodno. I love Vodno. I remember fondly many hikes up Vodno and then from Vodno over to Matka and then down Matka Canyon and you reward yourself with a great big lunch down there. I think it's called the um I forgot the name of the restaurant. There? Uh they, I can't remember. they redid it a lot, you know, the one next to the church. Yeah. It's not a very posh yeah. place, like uh, all okay. the, all fancy food and stuff. It's uh, uh, unrecognizable from what what it used to be. Yeah, well, that, I, I fondly remember that, and you know, next time I'm back there, the weather is good, of course, I want to do that, but um, we are not here to talk about the weather, we're here to talk about uh, Macedonia, and uh, never a dull moment, especially this past week, actually too much news, in my opinion, mm. uh, Macedonia signed the NATO accession protocol, I think that's the correct uh, way of describing it, in Brussels. And now the uh, 29 member states of NATO will uh, agree or perhaps disagree (laughs) to Macedonia's membership in NATO. Uh, And I thought we'd start off because, you know, Svetin, you and I follow social media so much and and, uh, folks are using social media to talk about the news and what's going on in Macedonia and NATO, etc. And apparently Macedonia is the emoji country because everybody seems to be using the emoji flag of Macedonia because they are uncomfortable saying Macedonia, they're uncomfortable saying North Macedonia, they're uncomfortable saying Skopje, they're uncomfortable saying Northern Macedonia, they're uncomfortable saying former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. They don't know what to do Hmm. when, of course, the clear answer is just say Macedonia because that's the name of the country. And I I saw that NATO uh, used the the Macedonian flag emoji uh, for the language, yep. so it wasn't even it wasn't even an issue of of not wanting to say the name. It was wanting to avoid saying the language, and so they've got fr- English, French, Russian, and then the Macedonian flag. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just it you gotta laugh. Yeah, the the language uh, is the one thing that was supposed to be most strongly protected in the agreement, unlike right. the nationality, where you can insist that well, it's not nationality, it's citizenship, but the language was supposed to be recognized by the uh, PRESPA agreement uh, with some caveat that it's a Slavic language, which is, okay, essentially true. Blah, blah, blah. But then the problem is that the language brings another country into the mix because Bulgaria does not recognize the language. It insists that the Macedonian language, according to them, is the Western dialect of the Bulgarian language, which is spoken in the, uh, in the Republic of Northern Macedonia. But if they, if they use <laughs> Macedonian as official language, then Bulgaria would probably uh, object. Bulgaria called uh, the Macedonian language in its agreement, which it got uh, Zayev to sign, the official right. language according to the constitution of the country, something like that. So they're avoiding right. using the word Macedonian language. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And I, and I see that there uh, saw a news article just pop up uh, you know, in the past couple of hours here. Uh, the Bulgarian Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense, Krasimir Karakachinov, mm. Karakachinov, Karakachinov. Has, again, yeah, uh, has complained again about Macedonia. Uh, and he says, uh, let's see, you know, well, anyway, we know what he's saying. He's, mm. he's, he's going to use every opportunity to complain about Macedonia, calling itself Macedonia or the Macedonian language or the Macedonian people, etc., 
Uh, yeah, sorry, that's that's not even the the craziest thing Karakachanov did uh, lately. He's actually, you know, this is now a side issue for him. His main issue right now is he's promoting a plan for the Roma minority in uh, Bulgaria, which includes organizing like work, uh, this communist style uh, brigades, who, which would clean up the Roma ghettos. They're actually using this word, and he's uh, wow. uh, going to obviously uh, abolish uh, and welfare if you do not educate your children, which is reducing the welfare state. The Roma are horribly served by the welfare state. But then <laughs> he's coming out in favor of uh, doing something, he says, about the very high uh, demographics of the Roma community and uh, uh, making abortion more accessible. <laughs> wow. That's, that's an interesting, uh, wow. that's an interesting when, character. When? When are, when are uh, parliamentary elections in, in Bulgaria? We need regime change there. Uh, it's, it, it would probably be more Karakachanov uh, in the next elections. I mean, this is the, uh, the way they're going. This is the way Europe is going. So I don't think... Oh, uh, yeah. Because he's, he, he's not from the same party as uh, Boyko Borisov, is he? Oh, he's I can't remember. The, he's from the Vimera party. He has a Vimera uh, party. Oh, okay, right. Okay, but yes. uh, the Bulgarian Vimera, and he insists that uh, party, they are the yes. real Vimera and... Uh, well, again, go, going back to what we started with, kind of, you know, again, back on the social media because it's, it's fun and we follow it, seeing that people are, they're not sure if they should say north or northern. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the so called Prespa agreement clearly lays out what it should be. But even in the Macedonian language, I know it, 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 it's a bit confusing. Um, and, of course, the simple answer to all this is all thinking people just say Macedonia. Mm. Uh, well, we, we say uh, Republika Severna Makedonia, I mean, this is what the name that is imposed on us, and it would mm-hmm. translate into English as Northern, not North. Yeah. If you would say yeah. Republika Sever Makedonia, that makes no sense in Macedonian, but that would be the translation of Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't really think it makes much difference for us. I mean, we used to argue a lot about whether we should accept uh, words like Skopje into the name, which would then easily uh, turn into, we would find ourselves calling the, uh, being forced to call our language Skopjan language instead of Macedonian, or using Skopjaner for the nationality instead of Macedonian. So this is something we desperately wanted to avoid. Obviously, we want, didn't want to use any name change for domestic purposes. Um, we'll see. I mean, it's, it will be difficult for the Greeks to impose a new language like the Northern language uh, without Macedonia. I mean, Northern Macedonia probably means that the name of the language will remain Macedonian. I, I, I look more into, I'm more interested at this point into what it would look like for the uh, foreign languages, like in English, we practically know what it would be. In German, it's going to sound very, very ugly. It would be a one word uh, they, they wouldn't say Northern Macedonia, like two words. They would say right. Nord Macedonian, one word. And, and then in the French, the Latin languages, I think it would then be Republic of Macedonia del Norte or du Nord. Right. So then it's, yeah. it's different. Then, then in the, these languages, we preserve the Republic of Macedonia and the adjective <laughs> goes at the end. So I, I guess right. the Greeks will be looking into ways to make it more mixed up, uh, try to avoid having this clean Republic of Macedonia used uh, anywhere in any language. Right. And, of course, one of the benefits of listening to this podcast, the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast, is we give you, our listeners, real and practical information. And, of course, as regards the name, uh, the simplest thing to do is just to say Macedonia. It's shorter. It saves time. Everybody wants to save time. Uh, and it's very descriptive. Everybody knows Macedonia and the Macedonians. So this is going to be interesting to watch it play out and see what happens. Uh, and that's uh, that's something that we're going to be obviously monitoring. Of course, again, all thinking people will simply say Macedonia, Macedonians, and Macedonian when referring to the language. And that's just the way it's going to be, whether they like it or not. And it'll be fun to watch them throw temper tantrums over this. Um, Let's let's move kind of a little bit into we've got European uh, elections coming up in May for the European Parliament. We see some of the candidates uh, um, for the major parties that are, are campaigning. Brexit, we're not exactly sure how that's going to play out and whatnot. But, I, you know, taking a kind of a, a 30,000 foot, 10,000 meter perspective here, looking at the whole thing, we see that um, there's this growing rift in the European Union. Uh, over uh, the the center right and um, 
uh, they call them nationalists, uh, sovereignists, whatever you want to call them, the nation, those who believe in the nation state, and the progressives, the far left, those that want to destroy the nation state and sovereignty, etc. Uh, I see that uh, the, the former prime minister of Macedonia, Nikola Gorevsky, has kind of he's 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 started talking. Uh, I don't know if it was a proper interview or uh, his social media. Why don't you bring us up to speed on on what uh, Grevsky said about uh, kind of this 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 new battle for the Macedonian name and identity after it joins NATO and the European Union? Yeah, he did both. He had a, a proper TV interview, uh, albeit a relatively short one with Sittal Television from uh, Budapest. But then, more importantly, he now published uh, a, a, a two-part uh, extensive uh, Facebook comment, which is. Essentially, his, uh, he calls it a paradigm change, a paradigm shift on the name issue. Uh, basically, he acknowledges that the concept of uh, resolving the name issue with a fair, uh, normal, uh, we would call it Czovechki, like a human like compromise with the Greeks, a reasonable compromise with the Greeks, has failed after uh, he uses the word extensively, a puppet government was installed in Macedonia by Good description. the internationals who pressed so strongly to uh, remove him from office, yeah. Uh, and then uh, his point uh, going forward is that we shouldn't do anything uh, which would uh, prolong our accession into EU and NATO. NATO should be a given, the accession protocol is signed, full membership should follow uh, within less than a year, uh, he, that is his estimate as well. He puts uh, EU membership at between six and eight years, and he, he believes that we should not try to impede this process, even though he acknowledges that emotionally everybody here, and you know, I, I feel it, uh, people feel it here, uh, we wish all the worst to uh, all those who pushed us down this road and uh, the internationals, the Europeans, uh, their domestic collaborators. And obviously we wish that, you know, my point is that whichever outcome uh, brings Zayev closest to being kidnapped by the people he overpromised to and underdelivered, and then he gets what he deserves. You know, that's the best for me. Gravesky is taking a, a rational, a reasonable approach. He says we should join these institutions and then we should start the fight for Macedonian statehood, national identity, obviously the name, which is maybe the smallest part of all these uh, things, uh, from within uh, the institutions, from the position of already having uh, veto power, having uh, an equal uh, position with Greece and Bulgaria and other countries within these institutions that basically the fun starts then and there after we join uh, these two institutions and that we shouldn't do anything to impede the process uh, in the next several years, no matter how personally humiliating and uh, exhausting that is. He believes that once we join, that one part of the international community which was leading the charge to pressure us to change our name and bring down the government and install these idiots in power would lose interest. The part of the internationals who actually care about having another NATO member, it would still leave other internationals more closer to us, our neighbors who were not involved in this process because they wanted a, a member state of NATO and the EU as a neighbor. They wanted Macedonia dissolved, our national identity destroyed, morphed into Bulgarians or Serbs if Serbia could get away with it or Greece could influence the process, uh, divided between Macedonians and Albanians or Bulgarians and Albanians, etc. So um, these powers would still continue pressuring for the demise of Macedonia. And Grievski believes that, you know, this is where we should fight uh, in the interim period, but all the while uh, doing everything we can to actually join the two institutions so we could reduce the pressure from foreign countries onto us. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think I see more and more people in the Macedonian community, um, Macedonians in Macedonia, and then, of course, here in the diaspora, talking about this. What do we do next? How do we do it? And I think what you're saying is Gorevsky's saying, you know, we fight it from the inside. And I think a lot of people are, you know, you have to, you, you accept that. You accept what has been done. It's it's wrong. It's unfair. Of course, life isn't about fairness. Uh and then you work to to change it over time. Uh, that's what they've done, and now it goes back, and now it's our turn to work to change it. Um, I want to bring up uh, you know, uh, an article that um, I just posted recently uh, by my friend uh, uh, Mario Christovsky from uh, uh, 
Ohio. He's actually born in Bitola, but he's an American citizen. He wrote uh, a pretty good article here on you know what to do next. He says the Prespa agreement is a mess. Here's what we do next. He, he, and we'll put this up in the show notes, but let me just read a little bit. He says the Prespa agreement is a monstrosity. It's moral and political spew on every ground. Every one of its pages imbues the Orwellian warning, quote, the most effective way to destroy people is to die, deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history, unquote. Not only does it suffocate the cries of ethnic cleansing from the not-so-distant past, but it also attempts to draw a moral equivalence between the parties as being co-equal aggressors and transgressors in this dispute. Uh, and then he goes, he goes on to say the Prespa Agreement is nowhere near the level of brutality we've seen in the past. However, it can be if we let it. If we sit back, continue complaining vocally but doing nothing, and thus allowing our children, grandchildren, and posterity to be eradicated. This won't happen overnight. It's an ever slow drip of complacency and indifference that accumulates over time to a nightmarish reality. Then he goes on to explain, you know, what do you do? Uh, and, you know, his answer, I think, is you strengthen the church, the family, the community in Macedonia and outside of Macedonia to, to, um, to talk about the importance of history and heritage and culture and to pass that on to the children to make sure, you know, because we know that the agreement, the Prespa Agreement and the agreement with Bulgaria are going to try and eradicate Macedonia's history and heritage in the textbooks. Uh, and so that, that's part of it. And so I think going back, just taking a step back, I think this is what we are going to see more and more of uh, in Macedonia and in, in the diaspora is coming up with these these important um, uh, points, these strategies on how to uh, battle this uh, as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, obviously uh, in a roundabout way, in a upside down way, I'm actually hoping that uh, uh, Greece and you know Bulgaria to a lesser extent will try to use the two agreements to the maximum extent because otherwise, you know, uh, this is why we were complaining against these agreements, why we were complaining about the name issue in general, that it's not just a small cosmetic change which everybody can live with. Somebody will use an emoji instead of North Macedonia, somebody will say Macedonia and then will be shouted at by Greeks, but then nobody would call us Northern nurse, it's that stupid. Uh, no. But you know, uh, it's not a cosmetic change. Since the beginning, we insisted that it's actually an all-out assault on the Macedonian national identity and sovereignty. And, uh, you know, if Greeks and Bulgarians are lazy and do not use the whole uh, uh, armament given them by the, by the, by the two articles, uh, you know, us opponents of the, of the deal will certainly look out stupid and nobody wants to, wants to be seen as stupid. Uh, obviously, we all know that they're not going to be lazy. They're going to be meticulous about this. They're going to be in your face about it. They're going to demand uh, regular meeting, government meetings, committee meetings, and going to impose new requests, new demands, especially once uh, the conservative, the right-wing party takes over in, in Greece, as will happen soon. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're going to uh, de demand things that no sane, normal self-regarding uh, uh, nation would accept. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, we, again, I, I agree that with the point that we should join EU and NATO uh, at this point. I, I, I've been a staunch opponent of joining the European Union. Uh, I've been pro-NATO, but after what has been done to the country, I obviously have zero respect for the institution and uh, uh, wish it all the worst. But again, uh, these two organizations are so badly designed, so uh, misshaped, uh, offer so so uh, uh, wrong set of incentives for their member countries, uh, in incentivizing the member states not to spend enough money on their own self-defense, uh, try to piggyback on the United States, uh, more importantly in the EU, incentivizing them uh, to run up huge debts and then go running to Germany demanding for a handout. You know, uh, I believe that at this point, ma causing maximum damage to these institutions would be to have a deeply frustrated, angry, impoverished country like Macedonia with exceptionally <laughs> skewed political processes inside and destroyed rule of law, etc. As a member state, will do more damage to them. When Grishki speaks, let's join them. He kind of almost gives like an impression that uh, 
these are sensible, uh, worthwhile uh, institutions. He doesn't say this, but we get this impression. Uh, but I, I, I would support joining them, hoping that we would be able to do as much damage as Greece did per capita. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we will. I mean, pretty soon we'll have, uh, you know, Zayev misappropriating, stealing, essentially, European Union funding, Macedonian people smugglers taking migrants straight to Germany with even more ease as they relax our uh, travel regime, uh, etc. Uh, poor people from Macedonia, Roma especially, this, is a, this has been happening for a while, but it could become even more prominent going to Germany demanding uh, political economic asylum, as they call it, essentially living there on government handouts. So, you know, let's, uh, they want us so badly inside, uh, they, they were willing to put us through all of this uh, in order to have us as a member. Fine. Uh, they did their worst. Now it's our turn. We'll, we'll do our worst. Tell us, Sutton, how do you really feel about these organizations? Well, <laughs> don't hold back. You know, just, yeah, yeah, yeah don't hold back. Well, taking a, taking a, just taking a step back. Um, and, you know, we could do pod. We could do a podcast every week on these on what I'm about to say, uh, but both the European Union and NATO were created in response to uh, the the two world wars and the rise of the Soviet Union. They're both um, institutions created as a result of, of those wars, and then the Cold War, of course. The European Union, and it's a little known, it's it's little known, but the European Union is actually an American creation. The CIA had a, and it's well documented, the CIA had a large hand in the creation of the European Union, and originally it was supposed to be just a, an economic a trading block, and I have no problem with that. The problem, yeah, the problem I have with the European Union is it's become this all-encompassing leviathan, this sovereignty-sucking project that demands ever closer union uh, and more sovereignty away from the individual nation states and vests it in Brussels in unelected men and women uh, who have no responsibility or accountability to the parliaments, the sovereign parliaments that are elected by the people in the individual nation states. Now that's, that's all I'll say on the European Union. On the NATO side, NATO obviously was, a, was created uh, in response to the Soviet Union. Um, I think what is it? What did they say? It was designed to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a Cold War institution, and we all know the history that after 1991, after the Berlin Wall fell, and then after 1991, and the Soviet Union ceased to exist, uh, it, it didn't really know what it was supposed to be doing, and it it started going what they call out of area, and that's why. Uh, you, you, you've had it, uh, you know. Well, we, we saw the, the well-documented involvement in in the countries of the former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I remember Bill Clinton saying in 1995, "We're going to go in there for one year, and they're going to leave." We still have troops there, uh, and so it's been. NATO has been looking for its raison d'être, its reason for existence, uh, and it, I don't think it's still really found that. Um, but anyway, that's a you know these are questions, these are discussions that we could you know spend hours or days or weeks on. Um, but okay, so we we, we know Gursky's position. We certainly know your position. Um, it will be very interesting to see going forward. Uh, just to kind of switching subjects very slightly to the cost of NATO membership, since that's where we are today. And and nobody's really been talking about what is it going to cost Macedonia in terms of actual. Payments, uh, uh, to, you know, in, in terms of actual payments to upgrade its its security forces, its military, uh, to say nothing, of course, of the cost of the Prespa agreement. Have, have there been any estimates on that yet? Oh yeah, uh, well, not on the Prespa thing. That's uh, open ended, and okay. uh, you know, just God knows, uh, replacing right. every single piece of paper which has the word Macedonia on it in this country is going to be excruciatingly expensive and time consuming. Uh, also, the other uh, law which was passed to placate the Albanians to, uh, in all this process, which is bilingualism in Macedonia, which is another way which the country is being redefined. But uh, we had the uh, Defense Minister Shekerinska come out, and uh, she insisted that we are only going to spend 1.2 million euros for NATO. Imagine that. Wow. That, that, doesn't, that sounds pretty cheap. Obviously, she's, That's a bargain. she's talking only about the uh, 
I, I believe the administrative costs for, of NATO membership, like uh, keep paying the rent or keeping the lights on. In reality, we we'll spend about 120 million for defense, uh, and that includes uh, a bloated uh, defense bureaucracy. This is not. This doesn't all go into fighting forces. Uh, a lot of this is like travel and uh, these plush dinners and lunches given by the defense ministry. But let's say 120 million. Our um, economy is about 11, uh, almost 12 billion uh, euros, which means if we're supposed to spend 2%, we should double our defense budget. We should go over 200 million. And Shekerinska, to her credit, acknowledged this. And she said that by 2024, we should reach this number. So we, we would more than double or almost almost double the defense budget in uh, what's it now three more years which is unbelievable uh, incredible it's going to include all sorts of waste and mismanagement and outright theft and abuse but the funniest thing I, 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 this, this is what i'm looking forward to you know our friend vladko georgev is in washington right now and he posted a photograph with uh, tucker oh, yes. carlson he met tucker he met, he met sean hannity and, oh, and Ta yeah. Tucker is the guy who actually caused this huge ruckus with Montenegro when he actually right. uh, saw Trump as he does and he asked him, well, you know, there is this country Montenegro and Trump went off. They're violent people, which, which they are, obviously. Montenegro has been in war with all its neighbors within uh, my lifetime, within very recent, very recently. It split yeah. from one neighbor and went to war with all the others, except with Italy, which is across the sea. But actually, Italy bombarded Montenegro. It fought with Kosovo, fought Croatia, besieged Dubrovnik, went to war uh, with Albania by proxy, if you consider the Kosovo yeah. war. You know, and, and, and Trump went ballistic. So I can expect that shortly, at some point, uh, Tucker will see Trump again and mention, well, Remember Montenegro? There is another country with the, <laughs> from the same region with a similar with name. The letter, it starts with the letter N, not N. So, yes. <laughs> and, and let me tell you how much they spend on defense. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's going to be well, of course, and, and, and of course, a quick aside, we have Tucker Carlson to thank for the name of this, uh, this uh, podcast because he had Mark Stein on some years ago, well, right after the 2016 yeah. election, and, and Stein talked about the, the Macedonian content farmers. Yeah. Um, but, but going back to the spending issue, of course, this is a, this is a, a you know, a, a, a legitimate complaint of uh, President Trump and the people that elected him is that European nations who are members of NATO have not spent what they should spend on the collective defense, uh, which has, and we, the American taxpayer, have been paying for it, which has allowed the European nations to uh, create their very, very generous welfare states. Um, Whereas, whereas Americans, you know, don't have that same thing. And so this is it's a legitimate complaint. Uh, you know, we've read articles and, and listened to pundits and analysts on both sides say, you know, one thing or the other. Um, but, uh, but going back to the original point on Macedonia spending what it needs to spend and what it's going to cost. And, you know, and, then, and then actually this is a good segue then. Um, how is NATO membership going to tangibly benefit and positively impact the everyday lives of Macedonian citizens. Riddle me that, Batman. I mean, honestly, when uh, Yugoslavia was falling apart, when there were wars all, all around us, uh, being a member of NATO would bring a huge premium, you know, security would bring a huge premium. At this point, most of our neighbors are in NATO uh, or occupied by NATO, but like Kosovo, uh, so, you know, realistically, a conflict, uh, you know, uh, the source of conflict was actually Kosovo, twice for Macedonia, during, especially during the political crisis in 2015, when right. a group of Kosovars attacked the city of Kumanova here. And they're coming, uh, attacking us. They're literally crossing through the largest NATO US uh, military base in the region, which is Bond Steel. So to say that we're going to get some additional security by joining NATO while we are being attacked from a NATO protectorate, it's, it's ludicrous, it's ridiculous. Uh, right, I, but, yeah. but on, the, on the economic side, how is that going to benefit tangibly the everyday Macedonian in his or her life? I don't see it, honestly. I mean, well, yeah, I don't either, but let me, let me, I just want to bring this up real quick. I, I saw a tweet the other day from uh, the Dutch ambassador, mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, I don't, I'm not going to mispronounce his name. Um, Uter Plump. Okay. Uh, he put out a tweet. Uh, this was actually just after Macedonia signed the accession accord. Mm -hmm. And he said in the tweet, he said, uh, hashtag NATO membership. So NATO membership brings economic growth and jobs. Good day for uh, Macedonian flag imagery. <laughs> Uh, private sector and visiting alkaloid employing 1400 mostly young skilled people in Skopje. okay good true so but he's his, the, the point of his tweet was trying to tie nato membership brings economic growth and jobs and then he tied that in by visiting alkaloid and i had to point out uh, alkaloid was founded in 1936 in macedonia 13 years before nato was founded and it's done a v and it's it's been a w wonderful company and employed uh, and exported despite the fact that Macedonia has never been a NATO member. So I was a little bit confused as to you know he's visiting Alkaloid to make the point that NATO membership brings economic growth and benefits, but Alkaloid's done just fine without mm. NATO membership. Thank you very much. And you know which country is the major foreign market for Alkaloid? No, Russia. <laughs> But, well, we, oh, we were joking today. oh, the ironies! The ironies practically write themselves. Yeah. We were joking today. Zaf, uh, he made this uh, populist promise that he's going to remove the iron fence from around the government building, and they did yes. it. Ultimately, they did this today, and we were joking. Well, good. They're clearing up the approach for the expected uh, deluge of foreign investors coming here, begging to invest in Macedonia. So we don't want them cramming through the narrow uh, gateway, they can now enter the government from all sides and try to sign their contracts. But seriously, this is this is ridiculous. I mean, nobody expects well, this anymore. Well, in, in fairness to Zoran Zayev, he did last fall, I believe, welcome Kentucky Fried Chicken yeah. to Macedonia as a foreign investor. And, you know, I'm not sure how many, you know, probably um, maybe dozens of jobs yeah. uh, in the service sector uh, and I like look I like Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC as they've rebranded themselves mm -hmm. but um, yeah what here's the point let's let's be serious for a moment yeah NATO membership sure it, it has that that good housekeeping stamp of approval and again Macedonia is not in NATO yet it won't be until all 29 countries sign the accession accords um, but even then uh, so foreign investors are going to be looking at Macedonia. They're not looking at the fact that it's it is or about to become a NATO member in a vacuum or by itself. They're looking at the totality of the picture of what is going on in Macedonia. The whole issue of corruption, uh, and I'm going to save. You know, I'm going to talk about my farmers' picks a little bit later towards the end, but it has to do with that. The whole issue of corruption, which Zayev promised to tackle, which he hasn't tackled. Uh, the whole issue of, of regional security and stability, and as you just pointed out, Kosovo is still going to be a source of, I think, regional insecurity, and uh, especially as they continue talking with Serbia, and that's a whole other subject where we get into it, etc. So my point being that foreign uh, companies aren't just saying, oh, you're a member of NATO or you're, uh, you're going to be a member of NATO. We're going to come in and invest hundreds of millions of euros. That's not the way it works. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would love to be, uh, to have international institutions which promote free markets, pr promote individualism, personal responsibility, etc., uh, and which are essentially anti-communist. I mean, I would love to be a member of a f older NATO, uh, and I, I was a strong supporter of this. But at this point, yep. uh, these organizations and the countries they represent are set up in a way that they're no longer beacons of free markets and personal responsibility and individualism. They're actually, in some cases, actively promoting utopian left-wing socialist dreams of, uh, uh, you know, supranationalism. Uh, and they're, they're actively trying to confront, you know, uh, I have absolutely uh, very little love lost for Russia, but it's no longer the communist country you need to fight. I mean. Uh, if you want to pick an ideological foe, there are other, uh, uh, you know, China or the radical Islamic countries. They would be, a, uh, you would argue, you could say that they're far more um, worthy of being uh, reformed, broken and then reassembled if this is what you want to do. Then Russia, which is just like a largely normal oligarchic, uh, sure, spoiler, troublemaker, of course, country. But uh, ideologically, I do not see a reason to confront it at this point uh, that no, lo it no longer is communist. NATO would not help us in the 
problem we will have, uh, which would be uh, separatism, uh, especially by the Albanian minority. They do not help countries with this. They do, could not help, you know, uh, the United Kingdom with Scotland or Spain with Catalonia or the Turks with the Kurdish uh, insurgency. They would do nothing about this. But in fact, getting us to uh, be beaten down to the point that we accept joining NATO under these humiliating circumstances uh, meant that Macedonians relinquish a lot of their national so sovereignty in the country, uh, in Macedonia, which in turn emboldened Albanian separatism and nationalism. So pushing us uh, into this allegedly beacon of stability actually made us less stable because it whetted Albanian nationalist appetites and now there, there will be no putting them back in the bottle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you mentioned ideological battles and adversaries and, and you bring up a very good point. Obviously, I think China is, is the number one uh, potential adversary of the United States and Western civil. So communists, go fight them. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. They're, they are absolutely died in the wool communists. Uh, then radical Islamism, uh, radical Islamic extremism. Uh, but then the other one, I think, and this is something I want to, as, as hopefully news starts to you know, we don't have this deluge of, of daily news about Macedonia that's going on. I, I want to think about it. I've been thinking about it for a long time, reading about it, writing about it here and there. I want to write more about it and talk about it. And that is the, the creeping um, ideological battle within Western civilization itself. And it's, it's kind of funny um, because the voice, the, the lone voice in the wilderness in the last century that was trying to warn the West about this, was a Russian, mm. yeah. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, and 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 you know his voice is still uh, loud and clear today. You, I see more and more pundits writing about what he said in his warning to the West about the dangers of of of, of um, secular militant atheism and the radical personal autonomy and radical individualism. All of these things, of course. Are, are creeping into uh, the West and eventually will bring it down from within. And we can talk about parallels in history and history, etc., but we're not going to go there now. But anyway, um, let's move on. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a break to allow our listeners to, uh, of course, they can always push the pause button. Pause button. This is a podcast after all. Uh, but why don't you and I take a break and uh, grab a refreshing beverage? You're listening to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. We'll be right back. There's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. And welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. Jason Miko and Svetin Chilmanov. Svetin, it's time for our farmer's picks. What are yours? Well, uh, I'm keeping uh, in line with what we're discussing so far. Um, I was reading an article in the New Statesman about the European Union, and I think it's uh, interesting uh, to share with our readers. Uh, this is, uh, it's written by, uh, by a historian called Brendan Sims. Uh, and he... Oh, I, you know what? I just started reading that article earlier, and then I got distracted. I have to go back to it. So fill me in on that. I'm interested. Well, it's, it's a good uh, parallel between uh, the Thirty Year War and uh, the, war, the conflict between the Catholic Church and the uh, Reformation. Uh, but uh, he's stumbling. Can you can you uh, let our readers, our readers, readers, let our listeners know? You say the Thirty Year War, like everybody knows what that is. That was the one where the German uh, statelets were fighting each other, whether they fall under the. Uh, newly founded uh, Protestant Church, or if they're going to stay stick with the Catholic Church, and then you know all sorts of good in the uh, in the 1600s. But that's the important yeah, part. Right. 16th century, no, right. all sorts of good stuff like the you know the sacking of Magdeburg happened, and uh, uh, he, he ma makes a point that even even after the Second World War, uh, Germans still considered the Thirty Year War to be more savage and worse than the. Uh, First World War and the Second World War combined, <laughs> just to give you wow. an impression of how badly things were. They, I think they like depopulated re regions of Germany to the extent of uh, yeah. more than half the population were, were killed, slaughtered, expelled, and uh, starved to death. Um, but he's trying to make also a point uh, about um, how it was uh, an important feature of this conflict was uh, uh, the, 
decision by the uh, by England to split from the Catholic Church to declare itself an empire, and uh, how Henry VIII. yes, and how this affected the uh, Catholic Church, uh, the Catholic leaders who did not want to have a repeat of this uh, development, and this easily, seamlessly flows into more recent developments when the United Kingdom is again trying to sort of kind of uh, leave the European Union and the EU reaction, especially now that we have uh, Donald Tusk, of all people, the president of the European <laughs> Council, uh, going all fire and brimstone against the British politicians for trying to, to leave the European Union, telling them there is... Oh, his, tw his tweet yeah. the other day was infantile. Yeah, like no place... Special place, special he said, place he said I think he said something, there's a, I'd like to know the special place in hell for the Brex Brexiteers who didn't plan, or something like that. Oh, yeah, It uh, absolutely goes hand in hand with all these images we have of... Uh, uh, you know, children uh, sitting there uh, draped with the EU flag in the European Parliament and these emotional comments from the bureaucratic uh, uh, interns who are doing the EU Twitter accounts or this, uh, uh, this other tweet from the European Union which was like the EU flag emoji is peace, EU flag emoji is love, EU flag emoji is democracy and respect for human rights. Like... <coughs> Excuse me while I puke. Uh, did, you, did, you, did you throw up a little in your yeah, mouth? So. A lot. And he makes a point <laughs> that uh, the Brexit project was thus Empire 2.0. Not so, not so much in the global 19th century sense, but in the sense of making the UK, to use the language of uh, the 1533 Parliamentary Act of Appeals, once more an empire unto itself. That is a sovereign, <laughs> legal and political space. This was primarily an assertion of authority rather than the articulation of doctrinal differences. It was, so to speak, a Henry VIII wow. moment. The response of the EU to this challenge, in some respects, resembled that of the old church and Catholic Europe to the Reformation. The sentiment was manifest in the response of Jean-Claude Juncker, president of the European Commission, to Theresa May's hope that they could make a success of Brexit. Brexit, he said, uh, Juncker, cannot be a success. There could be no salvation outside the Union, just as there was no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Brexit was an offense, not wow. merely to the European order, but to the European imaginary. In, in short, the EU is a cult. Amen. Amen. Preach, it. Preach it. Yes, it is. Um, um, wow. wow, and that's all from the Spectator article, right? Uh, the New Statesman. Uh, the new you would sorry. imagine yes, you would okay, read yeah, something excellent. like this in the Spectator, but no, it's the New Statement. <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, and, and I think it's important to, to point out, you know, that you, you mentioned the Thirty Years' War ended in 1648 in the uh, the Treaty of Westphalia, which wasn't a single treaty, but that's neither here nor there. It was <laughs> referred to as the Peace of Westphalia, which basically set the stage for the rise of nation states, which has been world order since that time. And of course, now we see. Uh, as you were just alluding to, this this attempt to dismantle mm. the nation state and create uh, empires again. Um, that's an excellent farmer's. Thank you. And uh, what have you got prepared for us? Well, uh, sort of on the same thing. Uh, it's kind of a two part. I want to set the stage with um, the American Chamber of Commerce in Macedonia, which mm -hmm. uh, is supposed to be pursuing, you know. Uh, Economic development and job creation, etc., for for Macedonian companies. I should know. I was the first executive director of the uh, AmCham back in 2001, but I saw that they just put out a quote call for socially beneficial ideas unquote, and they start by saying, "Yes, we are opening a call for ideas that solve social issues, contribute to social prosperity, and promote socially progressive values." Not free market um, or and progressive I find, values. Just yeah, socially yeah. progressive values. Which is kind of funny because back in August, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, together with Macedonia 2025 and Mazet, uh, put out a uh, press yes. release stating, the recent announcement for possible introduction of progressive taxation on personal income took the private sector by surprise and raised a lot of concerns. So, so on the one hand here, they're promoting now um, socially progressive values, but they don't like socially progressive income taxes, which I find ironic. Yeah, marvelous. So the U.S. Embassy was promoting uh, far leftist uh, people, in, including in the economy, especially in the, in the realm of uh, going post-national on us and uh, moving away from national paradigm, a nation-state paradigm, but also in the economy. And now they're increasing taxes, increasing regulation, 
uh, and Amcham is obviously hit, but still they want to uh, do an outreach and, and give even more money, their own money, to progressive leftist NGOs and thinkers and promote progressive policies. And this is essentially what Lenin once said, that these capitalists, they're going to uh, sell us the rope to hang them with. This is what, what it's Absolutely. Yeah. Bloody, yeah. Hell. Bloody hell. And of course, the Amcham... Um, a position on uh, socially progressive values uh, when they should be promoting jobs and um, uh, business growth in Macedonia leads me to what is actually my farmer's pick. It's the 2019 Index of Economic Freedom put out by the Conservative Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, they have just released it. Macedonia is in there as it is each year, and I find that um, this is interesting. So, Zayev has been in government now for almost two years and he campaigned on you know anti-corruption and the, and he didn't actually campaign on the name change but that we all knew that's what he was but he also talked about you know bringing in foreign investment and things like that and we've alluded to that already but the 2019 index of economic freedom uh, put out by the uh, heritage foundation macedonia actually declined it's and let me just quote here its overall score has decreased by uh, point two percentage of a point with declines in trade freedom, monetary freedom, and business freedom. Fiscal policy has been lax with unproductive public expenditures, including subsidies and pension increases, and rising guarantees for the debt of state-owned enterprises. So, it's a very small decrease, but it's a decrease nonetheless, and that's not good for Macedonia. And again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, NATO uh, membership and the idea of foreign investors coming in, they're not looking just at that. They're looking at things like this as well. And if Zoran Zayev and his government want to bring in foreign direct investment, then they're going to have to uh, change their tune on the economy and they're going to have to do a lot more and work much harder uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, see reforms in, in monetary freedom, business freedom, uh, taxes, of course, we know that the government of uh, Nikola Gorevsky introduced a flat tax, as was wildly popular throughout Europe, because it worked. And this government has increased progressive taxation, as we just talked about for a moment. So, um, bravo, Zoki, on uh, seeing the freedom in Macedonia. Yeah, come back, Nikola, always That's forgiven. <laughs> Good. Well, we've had a very robust... Um, podcast i think wouldn't you say i would certainly say so yep uh, i think next week we'll have more to talk about hopefully there will be less um actual uh you know th this deluge as i said earlier of daily news um and maybe we can uh, we can talk about some uh, some more long-term things but we'll see we'll see what next week brings don't count on always that. a pleasure this, talking this to everything. you <laughs> if, if Grefke puts the time frame to the next six to eight years this is going to be six to eight years of right. non-stop news Okay, well then, then we've got to figure out how to make this pay, uh, and then we could do twice a week, you know. And uh, again, sponsors—we're uh, always looking for sponsors for the, the literally tens of tens of listeners that we have. Okay, maybe Amtron <laughs> can pay us, and we can do something like a progressive podcast. Oh, I like that. Yes, we will. Uh, I'll reach out to them right Absolutely. away. Hey, always great talking you to you. Too, buddy. Take care.